to our next guest knows what you're going through. He knows all about those deadline dates. He is the author of Subtle Felonies. Austin, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, fellas. Glad to be here. Good morning. You know, I was trying to think, Austin, when um, kind of putting the, together the notes for the show, I was going to say when we met, and I realized that I don't, I don't know. You're one of those people I've always known. You know, it's just for the last, it's just always, always been part of the universe for the last, I don't know, for 20 years, whatever it's been. Well, you, you were already a big guy, so I remember meeting you. It was at Magna Cum Murder, which is a conference they do out in the Midwest. Okay, yeah, that was actually one of my favorite conferences. They don't do it anymore, but it was one of my favorite yeah. conferences. It's called Magna Cum Murder. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> yeah. sponsored it was, only writers. <laughs> it was sponsored by Ball State University and, yep. and run by. And, and you should see the 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 logo for this. Uh-huh. I mean, it's it's. Um, it, it was strictly a mystery conference for mystery fans and mystery writers, and people came from all over the world. I'm sure to to attend this thing. But Magna Cum Murder. Um, it's uh, it's not with us anymore. It uh, run by a lady named uh, Catherine Kennison. It's one of my favorite people in the world. And, and she passed away. No, she hadn't passed away. She's had some health issues, and it just isn't up. It might come back. It was just, as something it was else. Too much for her. It was too much for her. But it was some of the best people I ever met, and clearly yep. Austin is one of them. Austin, Austin, I have to ask you. I know you've probably been asked this question a hundred times, but are you related to Hector Camacho? I'm afraid not. <laughs> had, had to ask. He, he got paid a lot more for fighting than I ever would. So. <laughs> well, Subtle Felonies, I see on the website, is available at $14.95, and it's available on back order, too, uh, as well as I'm looking at the website here that has this information. Could you tell us about uh, your background in writing, Austin, and, and when you started doing this and how you got uh, the fever for it? Well, uh, I, I can tell you that... Uh... In the late 1990s, I was a big uh, mystery fan, read a lot of mysteries and thrillers, and uh, I was uh, reading a particular mystery one day, and I was like a third of the way through it, and I, I, I was sure I knew everything that was going to happen after that. And I said, uh, well, hell, I, I can do better than this. <laughs> and unfortunately, my, my wife at the time heard me say that, and said, oh, yeah, sure you can. I said, no, really. I said, so that became, let me sit down and try this. And uh, as it turns out, I just love uh, building that, that puzzle and, and writing us a, a kind of a whodunit kind of thing. And then I got hooked, so I just kept at it. And what were you doing before you had success as a writer? Well, I was uh, communications for Department of Defense. In fact, for the the Tricare portion, most of my career, I was, uh, you know, writing news releases and and articles. I was writing during the day, but that was all, you know, non-fiction-y stuff. And it it wasn't really what you'd call fun. But Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who who was more elated and delighted on their retirement day than you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that was... That was not so much about the job and more about working for the federal government, which over time went from being a, a minor inconvenience to a really hateful thing. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was glad to be out of that. Well, my wife's a Fed, and uh, the every three-year dance with shutting down the government is tiresome, I can tell you that, just uh, from that yes. angle, right? Yes, it, it, it wears you down at that, uh, that that room full of guys that makes the decisions doesn't have to live with their decisions, and uh, that that's just you know. Yeah, and they keep they keep getting paid too, which is exactly. the amazing thing to me. Uh, how the, uh, the the people in Washington D.C. work this thing. Their staffs don't get paid, but they get paid. Oh, they get paid eventually. You know, well, <laughs> bills aren't due eventually after, after they've <laughs> missed a couple of mortgage <laughs> payments. Bills so they do get paid. Is due. <laughs> Hey, uh, Hannibal right. Jones. Hannibal Jones is your character in this book here. Hannibal Jones: Mystery, Subtle Felonies. Can you tell me about the character himself? Uh, Hannibal is uh, a private eye, African American private eye, working in Washington D.C. He used to be in Secret Service, and uh, now he's uh, kind of a, a self-styled troubleshooter. He, he likes to help people when they when they get in a particular jam. So all of his stories. Uh, generally start out as missing persons or something stolen and he has to find it but they always end up uh, involved in a murder i tell you and how did you select the name hannibal jones well okay um 
say you you got to be in the writer's brain here, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm uh, I'm I've got a, a character whose father is in the military, and he he has a very common last name Jones, kind of an everyman, but he wants his son to have the name of a military leader, and you know Alexander's a little too common, and then he was casting around. And he said, "Well, wait a minute. There was this guy named Hannibal." who happened to be uh, a, a black person historically, but he was a military leader. He, uh, he was, had creativity. He had elephants in his army. He was the little guy who went up against the Roman legions and, and almost won. Hey, let's name him after him. And so that's, uh, that's how I got to there, thinking in the mind of Hannibal's father. I like that. That's a pretty good angle. So tell us what happens in Subtle Felonies. What, what, what's the book about? Well, okay. In in this particular case, um, Hannibal gets called uh, by the wife of a retired basketball star named Xander Brown. Uh, and uh, the thing is that Xander has gone missing. And the wife doesn't know if he was uh, grabbed by somebody or maybe he's just uh, got back into the drugs and he's off asleep somewhere or maybe he ran off with some young girl. But in any case, she wants to figure it out. She wants to know where he is without the press getting involved. And, and one of the things about being a, a big-name sports character is that your, your personal business becomes public business. She's trying to avoid that. So she hires Hannibal to find him. And in the, in the search, uh, he uh, meets a lot of this guy's friends who maybe they're not really friends. Maybe they're hanging out with him because he's got tons and tons of money, you know, from the multimillion-dollar contracts. And uh, he goes to some of the clubs that this guy goes to and, and finds out that, geez, you know, his, his life wasn't all as, as shiny as you, as you might assume. So uh, the, the, it bec- the, the case is, you know, is he hiding somewhere? Has he run off? Was he kidnapped? Which, you know, I don't want to throw out any spoilers, but uh, he, he didn't just run off. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me all these questions about the story. I don't know. <laughs> hey listen we were talking I, I want to give as many plugs out here as we possibly can i don't know how many uh, writers we have out in our listening audience usually there's there's quite a few austin created what i think is uh it i don't think it is unique among writers conferences among conferences in general which typically will focus on, in my case, I, I go to mystery conferences or thriller conferences. Uh, Austin created creator, uh, Creatures, Crimes, and Creativity, a C3, which is a conference that kind of goes across all genres and actually all art forms. Can you talk a little bit about that and give a pitch? It, you just Too late to sign up. You just missed it, but it'll be up next year. Yep, it'll be back next year. We, <laughs> we really did. We, we uh, created a conference. We wanted to gather readers and writers of all kinds of genre fiction. So you got mystery, suspense, thrillers, got some horror writers, but also science fiction, fantasy, paranormal. It, we, we find that, that all, these, all these people have a lot more in common than anything else. It's about trying to write a good story and, and write good characters. And uh, we, we have a lot of fun. It's a three-day deal. Uh, all the meals are included, so we all kind of sit together with the writers and the fans. And, uh, uh, hey, next year uh, I've got at least one keynote lined up that I know John knows, the great Lee uh, Goldberg, who uh, has written uh, tons of books, uh, also has written a lot of TV, and he's written books about the TV characters. So, showrunner. Uh, if, if you've he was a showrunner for Murder, now, She Wrote, wasn't he? Say again? Wasn't he a showrunner for Murder She Wrote? Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. He was the showrunner for Murder She Wrote, and and uh, has written several novels, and also Monk. I think is That's his right. other big name. Uh, the whole Diagnosis Murder. I think he was the showrunner there. So he's uh, he's pretty broadly based and, and wildly uh, funny, and wildly funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing that you, you're going to have a keynote speaker. He needs to be somebody that's just a good guy. And Lee is just a good guy. He's good to hang out with. Uh, he's, he's a writer's writer. He's a lot of fun. 
Austin Camacho is our guest on the program, the author of Subtle Felonies. Uh, so, Austin, you said you knew of John Gilstrap when you met him. He he had already emerged as a, as an author, right? Yeah. All right. So my question is, that: do you guys, and I don't mean just specifically the two of you, but do writers in general read other writers' work? Absolutely. Um, the only way for me to know what people are are wanting, what what readers are wanting, is for me to read, you know, what's out there. And uh, I don't think I don't think most of us consciously steal from each other. But there's no doubt that you read something that really strikes you and you say, wow, that's a that's an interesting turn of phrase or wow, I like the way this character did that. And it and it does. It leaks into you. You you like reprocess it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it comes out. Well, Rob, you you coach football, so you watch game films. Mm -hmm. And by watching game films, you get ideas on how the other teams are doing things. When By reading the work of other authors, it's not so much about plot points as, wow, that passage really moved me. It either made me laugh or made me cry or or it it scared me. I had to turn the pages. I planned to go to bed a half hour ago, but I got to keep reading. And it's by looking at the works of other authors and you dissect it and you realize how they did that. So that's... Or actually, I read just to for entertainment value. Mm-hmm. But there are times you're going through, and, and and it is kind of a master class. There are some really really good writers out there. Yeah. Well, it, but th- there's a difference though between what I do and what you do, and that's called copyright law. So, like, <laughs> I, if another team runs a kickoff return, I'm like, hey, why didn't I think of that? That looks pretty good. I can actually run that kickoff return the next week. And no one sues me for you know copyright infringement. However, if you're reading another author's books, and and you guys probably talk amongst yourselves about that that author, hey, he steals stuff every single book. Eh? You know that that's a guy there. You gotta you know make sure you get that stuff. Uh, you know, get your lawyer on that one. Uh, but how do you massage that? I mean, there's only so many ways you can make an egg, right? I mean, how do you ma- massage the the story so that you're not actually duplicating what somebody else has done. I, I think there are more ways than than the average person thinks of. I will tell you, if you if, if I sat down in a room with, with John and nine other writers that I love and respect and said, here's the plot line, here's the story, here's an outline for what happens, and we all went off into our own room, you would come up with ten completely different books. That's true. Totally and different. I actually do that in writers' conferences when I, when I teach. I give, you know, here's, here's the plot element, go, and I give them six or eight minutes to, to write. And it's astonishing how, how oh, widely yeah. different they are. Now, there are similarities. I mean, I write, I write sort of in the same sleeve of the thriller as Kyle Mills and Brad Taylor and Brad Thor and Vince Flynn, Rest His Soul. And, and, mm-hmm. but, but they all feature strong characters, but the characters are in, entirely different. Hannibal Jones... Um, and uh, Myron Bolitar from Harlan Coben, and there there are similarities to every PI book, but it actually, as it filters through the writer, everything gets changed. And copyright law. Hey, go, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it's funny. There there is this other element. Uh, whatever genre or subgenre you write in, there are certain th- things that the readers expect, and no matter how creative you want to get. There are certain parts like, okay, if I'm writing a hard-boiled detective novel, uh, at some point or another, that guy's going to get hit over the head. At, at some point or other, somebody is gonna, some, somebody's going to tell him a lie that's going to get him in trouble because he believes. I mean, there, there are certain, certain tropes <laughs> that if you don't do it, the reader's going to be disappointed. You know, every one of my books, you know, when you pick up the book before you open it, that the good guy's going to come out ahead and the bad guy's going to get his comeuppance. You know, if if, <laughs> if, if I'm reading, uh, 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 well, okay, maybe I'm reading one of John's books. Uh-oh. I know that uh, if there was somebody who was kidnapped and we're going after him, we're going to bring him back safe. Uh, that's my expectation. I'd be disappointed if that doesn't happen. So it, it, there are there are bumpers on both sides of that lane. In regards to the good guy versus bad guy element of this, for instance, you know when I watch The Sopranos TV show, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm rooting for Tony to get away with this stuff, right? When when I when I'm reading a, a mystery book, is it bad if the bad guy gets away with stuff? 
I, I guess it depends on the book. In, in, in any of my books, it, it would be bad if the bad guy gets away with the big bad thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there, 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 are, there are always those spaces of gray, and uh, good writers know that nobody is completely bad and nobody is completely good. So, uh, you know, is it, is it bad if that smuggler gets away with it? Well, I don't know. Is he smuggling medicine to some country where the, the rulers keep it all? Maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> no, we, we, that, in that case, he becomes a good guy. But in general, John or, or Austin, does the audience not want bad people to get away with bad things? The audience wants to leave satisfied. They, they've invested money and a great deal of time into a book. And you, and I think there's an obligation for the author to leave them satisfied. If a good guy is killed, and I have killed good guys, um, they better die for a good reason. If mm-hmm. bad guys survive, it better be because they're going to die in a future book. You know, the, the, <laughs> But the, the audience just needs to feel but satisfied. The, the audience wants, wants that guy dead at some point. Hey, BZ Kirst just said she ordered uh, an Asta Camacho book. And uh, by the way, Mr. Gilstrap is going to be at her book club in February, too. So BZ's ah. got the double header going on there. Very nice, BZ. Cool. Thank you for contributing that. Hey, Austin, I want to talk, going to put you on the spot here a little bit, because um, that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, you, you, I, I think it, was, it must be your author newsletter that I read that, that started all this, or maybe just an email, but mm-hmm. um, you have recently been giving some presentations on a topic that is growing within the 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 writing community, between, in, in the book community, and that is cultural sensitivity. And we've known each other a long time, and you know my sensitivity to some things hovers somewhere between zero and one. Um, so, how do what is the focus of your cultural sensitivity um, talks, and, and how do you see this into the future of the business? Well, um, since I'm, I'm generally talking to writers. My my focus is on uh, well actually it's it's kind of splintered. Part of my focus is uh, improving your work. You want to be a better writer, you got to write better characters. They got to be fully fleshed out and fully formed characters. Uh, it, that just that just makes better work. And if you're writing about people that you don't understand, or if you're saying things about people that's just plain wrong, that's 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 going to hurt you. Totally aside from that, there's a hungry market out there for stories with more diverse characters. Readers are tired of reading about the same people all along when they're looking around their world and they're seeing different people. So uh, you got you got to write, like you said, the reader's got to be satisfied. And if, if I live in a universe of diverse people, I pick up a book and everybody in there looks the same and acts the same, I'm not going to be satisfied and I'm not going to read your next one. And that's, that's the worst thing that can happen to a writer. It's an interesting concept, which begs the question, uh, when, I, when I read a book, I read the book like I'm the lead character in the book. I'm kind of going through what that lead character is going through, right? So right. I, I'm a 60-year-old dude whose family's from Sicily, so I, everything kind of comes at me from that perspective a, a little bit, right? Uh, okay. But w- when, when you write Hannibal Jones as an African-American, right? So yes. uh, do people uh, uh, understand that completely while they're reading the book? Uh, or, or do you get any feedback that says, I'm not going to read a book because I can't identify with an African-American uh, mystery uh, solver? Or do you hear any feedback like that? Well, I haven't so far. Uh, I guess be- partially because people who don't want to read my book don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Same with this show. People that don't want to watch or listen to this show, exactly. I don't know because they don't tell me. But but honestly, part of the the thrust and part of being culturally sensitive, if I can use that term, mm-hmm. is you want to emphasize the fact that we all have a lot more in common than the differences. And, and that's how, despite the obvious differences, guys like me and John can get along. Because, you know, regardless of what you look like or where you come from or whether you're straight or gay or whatever you are, everybody likes a good burger. Mm-hmm. Everybody loves their mom. 
you know, we have a lot more in common than the differences. And hopefully people can identify with Hannibal Jones because uh, he's pursuing the truth. That's his most important thing. I want to get to the truth. He's being kind to people. He's a little bit of a, a conservative guy. Um, walking that line between, uh, let's say, uh, chivalry and chauvinism. And I think that if if you're male and adult living in this country, you're dealing with that yourself one way or another. So I hope that people do uh, uh, identify with him. Well, I think when in creating any character, no matter what color, orientation, whatever, it's about selling the humanity of the character. And as long as the humanity resonates with the reader then i think you're everybody is the writer is squarely within his own lane you know most very recently kind of inside baseball here richard north patterson who is an insanely popular and best-selling writer i think he's a brit um put out a book that uh he couldn't give away because i'm, I'm gonna get the details wrong i'm sure but it was touted as the next to kill a mockingbird and it was about a black family's um uh trials and, and tribulations as as they overcame obstacles and the fact that richard north patterson was is, is white and is is a brit the american publishers got very nervous about the notion of was it um a cultural appropriation right which i'm glad yeah. you brought that point up because that was going to be my next question has that hit the writer's world yet when it comes to putting out a book is uh, if john gilstrap writes a book with an african-american as a lead character does that blow back on John Gilstrap? If you if you write a book with uh, an, an Asian lead character, does that blow back on Austin Camacho? Well, um, <laughs> uh, geez, it John, can. John knows John knows my reputation for being a smart mouth. So uh, <laughs> I've, 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 I've. You're only on the radio. I, say what's on your mind. <laughs> if I write a book about an Asian character, nobody's going to think twice. This whole cultural sensitivity thing is a white folk problem. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I agree. That's very well stated, 100%. And, and, I mean, the assumption is that I know what I'm talking about when I write about uh, people in various cultures. If You're right. If John Gilstrap were to write a, a book uh, with a, a black family as as the cent at the center of it, he probably might have trouble. If he was unknown and they didn't know what he looked like, uh, I mean, what is what is the single most popular black character in literature? Uh, James Patterson is not black, mm -hmm. but his books sell. Nobody knew, you know. Uh, today it, it can be a little touchy, and and I think it's very. Uh, if what uh, the the new the other Patterson says is the truth, I think it's very bad that they would judge him that way. Uh, I think you got to read the book. Well, you I know, think what in good, his well, in his case who wrote it in his case the allegations are, and again I haven't done a deep dive on this, is that the publishers were nervous about the the pushback that they were going to get. So therefore, yes. it, it it wasn't worth the effort. And I do write black characters. Vinicia Alexander, one of the main characters in the Grave Books, is 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 black. Um, I don't write about her race though. I write about her skills in what she does, and she happens to be black and. Um, I, I think you just have to know your lane and and not and not go into into territory that that you uh, you don't know. Um, Importantly to me, when you write Venice, you write her the same way as all the other supporting cast. She isn't slighted. She isn't brought way to the fore. She is one of the group. That's what makes it work, and that's what makes it valuable. Austin, I had no idea this conversation was going to go in this direction, but I'm glad it did. This was a very interesting aspect of uh, what writers do. Good stuff, man. So pitch your book real quick. Do it again. Oh, okay. Uh, what do I want to say? Subtle Felonies, the latest Hannibal Jones mystery novel. Uh, you will not guess the ending. You will love these characters. You will enjoy following the, the mystery and, and solving this puzzle, and you'll learn a lot about what happens to people who suddenly become rich and how that impacts them and their friends and their family. That's, that's kind of the theme of the book. John, you could write a book like that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> now, I could never write Austin's book. Only Austin can I, write Austin's book. I, I could write a book like that about John. Because <laughs> <laughs> it'd be a true story. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Austin, thanks so much for your time, man. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, guys. This was a lot of fun. Hope I get another chance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Thank you.